be empowered by the Spirit. Welcome back to church here today. And as we are on our series, as we're leading up to Pentecost, I want to teach you today on and give some practical examples as well as good teaching that we can access the Holy Spirit in our daily lives. What can we, the average Christian, expect to see and hear and feel the Holy Spirit do in our life in our time? Well, first, a little bit of background on the Holy Spirit. We know the Holy Spirit is fully God, uh, present in spirit form and to encourage us, to empower us, and to make sure the gospel ministry moves forward. The third person of the Trinity, he is holy and he is powerful and he is also a gentleman. And so with all of those adjectives that I've just thrown out there to you in descriptions, we're going to go into three ways to which uh, the believer can expect God to work in our lives. One of them is mundane ways. You know, it's not very obvious that the Spirit's actually involved at all. And I'm going to give you many examples of how that actually works. And then there's some that, uh, got, that the Holy Spirit works in a marvelous way, in the sense that like, you're not quite sure if it's a miracle yet, but it certainly is making you marvel at a situation or a happening or a coincidence. And the third is the miraculous. When we see miraculous healings or incredible wonders that are so far beyond our physical capacity. Now, we like to highlight on those when we read scripture, we say, oh, wow, look, the Holy Spirit came on Samson and he was able to take on an entire army. Or the Holy Spirit came upon Peter and he was able to preach in many different languages. And uh, so we think that the Holy Spirit acting in our lives is only going to be in those very uh, ecstatic ways. And the answer is no, it's not always going to be like that. We do expect that the Holy Spirit is going to be there to comfort. And uh, so as we teach on those, I'm going to give examples of each of those so you can see and maybe discern how the Holy Spirit has worked in your life and how the Holy Spirit's going to work in your life. First, I also need to say that it is unequivocal that this is the church age, which also means the Holy Spirit age. To say that the Holy Spirit is not active in people's lives today uh, is ignoring Christianity. Some people believe that that uh, the gifts of the Holy Spirit ended with the apostles, um, but that doesn't make any sense because they ended up, the Holy Spirit came on people from Ephesus long after the apostles. Uh, we see in Samaria, we see in other places where uh, in just ordinary people, the Holy Spirit came on with power and with gifts. So it wasn't just for the apostles, it was for the church age. Why would the apostle Paul teach on what to expect from the Holy Spirit uh, to the Corinthians if that was all just gonna die out as soon as he died? And now we do recognize that the nature of some gifts have, uh, have their limitations or changes because of fulfillment. For example, we don't believe that anybody who has the gift of prophecy today is going to be using it to write additional scripture. So we would understand prophecy today, yes, it still exists as a gift, but not to the point of writing new scripture, which is for all people for all time. And the new covenant has been established. There's no need for another scripture word to come until the end times. And, uh, and so that's where we're at. And But the prophetic gift of God revealing something to you in your mind or your spirit, that still exists today. And so we should expect the prophetic in our lives, in our dreams, in our you know, visions and moving forward. And that's what's prophesied that'll happen in the church age, is that we will see times of refreshing for the Holy Spirit, from the Holy Spirit, for this day and age, for us to live in this church age. So on to the mundane. What are some of the mundane ways? And I must say the mundane ways, if you look at the whole weight of scripture, I can't give you every example of this, uh, but I'm going to give you a bunch. But I can tell you this, of all the ways the Holy Spirit has worked in people's lives, the mundane has been absolutely, by a long shot, the vast majority of the cases. And uh, in, in comparison to miraculous acts of the Holy Spirit are actually exceptionally rare uh, compared to all the other acts that the Holy Spirit does. That is not to minimize or to get you not expecting miracles, but it's to really highlight how much the Holy Spirit is working in your life and you really don't even have a clue. And so what are some examples to help us to identify that? Let's jump into it. First, some of the gifts listed as uh, coming from the Holy Spirit are things that don't appear miraculous. Administration, leadership, I guess sometimes leadership can look miraculous, but everyday leadership, not so much. You're leading your family. God's going to inspire you to do that. That counts. The Holy Spirit's with you. We receive the Holy Spirit when we receive Jesus. So we're going to expect that the Holy Spirit is going to do the mundane things because guess what? We do mundane things. Our life is full of mundane things and the Holy Spirit is right there with us. The gift of helps, you know, stacking chairs, can that possibly be? Well, you know what? The first time someone was considered to be filled with the Holy Spirit in the Bible was the man, the artisan who created the Ark of the Covenant. 
God gave Moses the, the blueprint. He described it to the guy, and this guy was able to conceive it in his mind with the power of the Holy Spirit, and then to be able to craft uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So an, uh, art, can you imagine art being done as a gift of the Holy Spirit? But yet it wouldn't be really riddle, uh, realized by other people uh, other than for its exquisite you know, look afterwards of the intricacies of it. But you know, an artist, was the first, a craftsman, was the first person considered to be filled with the Holy Spirit uh, in the entire Bible. So even the list of gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, in the book of 1 Corinthians, teaching us in Romans, uh, teaching us on this, most of them are actually considered just mundane. They're just helping us along the way. You know, it's not always understood that, uh, that the Holy Spirit is there when just things are going great and people don't understand, why do I feel good? Why is this going well? In Acts chapter 9, it says that as the church grew all these different places as it was going, it says that they were encouraged by the Holy Spirit. So really just the general sense of the vast body of believers uh, in the first century, in the very beginning of, of, the, of the church age, that the number one way, in the most broadly way, uh, used way, the Holy Spirit has entered our lives, as dictated there in Acts chapter 9, is to encourage the entire church, many tens of thousands of people by this point, of just being encouraged. Have you ever gone to a place with the, where a bunch of Christians are and you just feel like, oh man, this place is just like, doesn't have... Uh, it's, it's, it's not happening. In other places, and not because of flash or fog machines or anything like that, but just you go to another place and you're like, wow, this place is just like the, the atmosphere is reaching your soul. And it's like, well, that's the encouragement of the Holy Spirit. See, we often separate soul and spirit way too much. We are a being that has a soul and a spirit. So we should expect, you know, you're saying, Jay, that's just things that are, are normal in everyday life where you get encouraged and, and, you know, crowds have a certain vibe. And, you know, yes, they do. And the Holy Spirit is in that. Uh, we can't deny that. We actually must proclaim that so that we can be thankful that the Holy Spirit is always near us. We just have to receive him. We just have to be aware. And, uh, you know, you can have sa uh, saving faith without engaging the Holy Spirit. Uh, he, that doesn't mean he's not going to engage you. But you're missing out. You're missing out. As Pastor Emma mentioned last week, to, to go get salvation, but then to not encounter the Holy Spirit is like, you know, being given the gift of a, a, a really beautiful sports car and just leave it in the garage. Nobody else sees it. Nobody else knows it's there. You know it's there. You go and maybe wipe the dust off it every so often and you just save it. Use that thing. Go squeal those tires. Uh, let's get working with the Holy Spirit here. So with that, I want to encourage you to see just in the day-to-day -day life, there's going to be what we often call God moments that we teach our children to look for. And I teach now adults. We need to look for the God moments. Where's God leading us in this life? And this is important too, because the more that we do that, the more naturally we take every step. You know, this is part of the reason why I believe we're taught to pray in Scripture, to pray continuously. That doesn't mean that we're always with our eyes closed and our head bowed. It just means we are always in fellowship with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is forever with us. In fact, we have, again, the Holy Spirit living in us. So we should expect there to be involvement of the Holy Spirit in every aspect of our lives. Every aspect. And if more and more people did that, we'd be less reactive to negative stimulus. We'd be more encouraged, even if there's difficult times that may come, because we know where our help comes from, and we know that our Father is with us, and that He's got us handled. Our whole countenance changes when we realize that we can spend every moment uh, thinking and praying and considering the Holy Spirit in all of our actions. Uh, in fact, even with this, I pray for these messages and I pray that the Holy Spirit would guide me. It's like, okay, I'm going to be talking about you. You know, Can, can you help me uh, have some words to help describe uh, how you are going to work in everybody's life? Uh, I just don't read the Bible and regurgitate stuff to you. I've got to pray in the Holy Spirit as well. This is why I pray quite a lot. It's like, you know, there's been a lot of um, uh, just old cliche talk about the Holy Spirit and I'm praying, Holy Spirit, can you give me, if you're infinite, there's many ways to describe Describe yourself. Can you help me to teach in this day and age what people are going to, to people to recognize you in their daily life? And if you ever think that something comes out of my mouth that seems pretty cool or a new perspective, thank the Holy Spirit, not me. Uh, he is going to enable us to speak and do great things. And so with that, the mundane, we should embrace that. Now, we can try to excite our lives up a little bit by doing a little bit more than our daily routines. Uh, but, but I want you to consider that the Holy Spirit is infinite. 
therefore involved in every part of your life. So let's not grieve the Holy Spirit. Let us receive the Holy Spirit and let us not reject or resist the Holy Spirit. Those are words used in the first few chapters in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 8 verse 16, we have the first deacon, Stephen, uh, who would end up being the first martyr just a few verses later, uh, would, when he's on trial basically for what he's been teaching, is he's in his last words in his, his sermon to them, he teaches them saying that you guys have always resisted the Holy Spirit. So he's telling them to stop this resistance because they're trying to stop the proclamation of Jesus Christ. And Stephen linked that with resisting the Holy Spirit. And so don't resist. So he accuses them of resisting it, uh, the religious leaders of his day. So let us not resist. Let us embrace and welcome the Holy Spirit. We're told to receive the Holy Spirit. Now, when we have Jesus, we have the whole Godhead because I don't know how you'd separate Jesus like in, in the Holy Spirit. I mean, it's the Trinity. And, uh, but we need to consider that uh, just another chapter later when um, others go to, uh, Philip goes to Samaria and they all believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are baptized in Jesus' name. But apparently Philip, who actually was transposed at different times from one place to another, that uh, didn't teach them about the Holy Spirit. And so when they heard that the Samaritans believed, the rest of the apostles went up to see what was going on. Because that, that was actually a hard trip for them because uh, the, the Samaritans were like the you know, the northern tribes, if you will, that were, that they considered to be heretics and lesser people. You know, the same tribalism that exists around the world here today. They use, oh, those people, they're so bad. God would never save them. Well, when they heard that they received Jesus, they were surprised. They had to go check it out. And when they did, they were teaching about the Holy Spirit and they didn't even know about it. And so then they prayed that they would receive the Holy Spirit. So it's not like they didn't have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wasn't present. They just were not taught to receive it yet. And so they prayed for them and then they became aware and the Holy Spirit revealed himself. And, you know, again, the Holy Spirit was always there. But do you realize it? How can the Holy Spirit not be everywhere? He is infinite. So I want to encourage you. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Not in a sense of a new, you know, like a big starlight comes down on you and lights you up, but like, have you received the reality that he is in fact there around you, with you, in you right now, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? If you have not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, he is still around you and he is leading you. That's one of his primary purposes to, to, is all gospel orientated, to lead you, to enable you to be able to believe to be able to see that Jesus is the Christ. Every one of us have had a Holy Spirit moment who has become a Christian because we cannot become a Christian without the Father first enabling us. And the Holy Spirit is that agent of salvation to quicken our soul to realize there's a whole lot more to life than what I can see with these eyes, what I can smell with this nose, hear with these ears, and taste with these lips. You know, there's a lot more to this world uh, and then what meets the eye. And the Holy Spirit reveals that, applies salvation to us, and lives in us to help us until it's time for us to receive full salvation in heaven. So don't do this life alone. How could you go through this life without using the help of the Holy Spirit? And in fact, that's what he is called, the comforter, the helper. He's sent by the Godhead to help us on our faith journey. So with that, being that he's also holy, let's not grieve him. We're taught in the New Testament to not grieve the Holy Spirit uh, or to resist or to quench the Holy Spirit. And when we sin and when we set our life's direction on things that are not holy, what ends up happening is, is that we just squash the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can't be a part of that. And so why does it say to quench the Holy Spirit? We quench the Holy Spirit because uh, he can't be involved if we're making evil plans. And uh, if anything, he's just going to be uh, prompting us to get back out of it. So I want to encourage you with this. Like our whole world has, you know, quenched the Holy Spirit. We're so busy with our own plans and our own lives and our own entertainment, which often is ungodly, that we quench the Holy Spirit in our lives. We basically tell him to go away. We don't want anything to do with you. We are in a sense adulterous to God because he is our creator. He is our beloved and we are going after other things so frequently. So I encourage you to go after the Holy Spirit is to also go after God's holiness. And I want you to know all of this in this way of uh, the mundane ways that the Holy Spirit works in our everyday lives. And it's the number one experience that you should have, that you just become encouraged, that you become part of the body of Christ, that you come to salvation, and that God helps you through all your steps in life. Now, next we can talk about the marvels of life when something happens and you're like, I don't know if that was miraculous, but that doesn't happen every day. You know, we do know that D David was filled with the Holy Spirit when he went out against Goliath. But a, a bystander, you know, he might have known that, feeling filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, others would say like, oh, I, 
the guy went out on the field and he killed the giant. You know, that's pretty remarkable, but that's not uh, in necessarily in their view an impossibility. So it was a marvel that this young man was able to take on the champion, the giant, and win. So it caught their attention like, whoa, what's God doing? And so with these, the, the marvel side of things is when we see something that we just did not expect to happen, something powerful happen from people who are not powerful. You know, if a powerful person does something powerful, nobody gives glory to God and it is not a marvel. And this is why I want to encourage you. If, if David had been a giant himself and been a warrior for a long time, we wouldn't be talking about David and Goliath for 3,000 years. We just, we just wouldn't. We just say one warrior beat the other warrior. Big deal. No, because the odds were so stacked against that there was like that only had to be God to help his hand in that. So I want to encourage you with this. Oftentimes, Christians think they need to increase their own platform in order for God to use them. And uh, which God can build a way better soapbox than I could ever. So don't go, just go after God and he'll give you the soapbox that he has called you to do. So many people have tripped themselves up with pain and with difficulty because they have given the talent that God has given them and they go, okay, I'm gonna do good in this secular field and then I'm gonna go and be a voice for God. And then by the time that happens, they're filled with fame, uh, arrogance, power, uh, money, wealth, and they end up plunging themselves. Like think of how many Christians went to Hollywood and ended up uh, their lives imploding shortly thereafter. Don't think you need to get famous before God will use you. In fact, God will continually and likes to use lowly people so that when something happens, everybody, the Holy Spirit can say, see everybody, I'm involved in your lives. Look at this marvel that has happened. And so let us look to that saying like, okay, God, you can do marvelous things in my life. So let's see what the world, how we can embrace the Holy Spirit and let the people out there, uh, when God works, we can say, you know what, that wasn't me. That was all the Holy Spirit. And then we can rejoice knowing that glory was given to God and we did our faithful part. You know, there's plenty of other things that have happened in uh, the New Testament uh, that appear to be marvelous, but not necessarily you know, is this, you know, the, the Apostle Paul was a, uh, a good writer. So it's like, okay, this is marvelously, like, you know, Book of Romans, the greatest piece of theology that we have in our entire Bible. And it's like, you know, uh, from the outside view, you might look at, well, this is kind of a marvel, um, but it's not necessarily looks miraculous. And so uh, as we consider these things, uh, the ability of even Stephen to preach while he was being persecuted, uh, from a bystander's point of view, you don't necessarily know that he's being filled with the Holy Spirit. But we know that as he is preaching to the Sanhedrin, he is, it says he is filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's giving him the words to be able to, to say and defend Jesus Christ. And, but an onlooker wouldn't know, but they would marvel saying, wow, that young man is not afraid of all these people who can take his head off and they ended up stoning him at the end of that speech. So I say that to let you know that marvelous things are gonna happen in your life, and you're gonna to wanna to shout from the rooftops that it was the Holy Spirit, but oftentimes we just need to let the Holy Spirit and the marvel speak for itself. And uh, so I want to encourage you, take, we're even told in scripture to take pride in our low position if we should so have one, for then God will raise us up if we have a contrite and broken heart and only want to be used by him then God will give voice. Then God will give uh, the recognition of those who are capable of handling it. It is interesting to see that when Jesus gave the parable of the talents, um, he said, okay, you've been faithful with uh, 10 talents. Now you can take on 10 cities. And so it's the principle of he who is faithful with little will be given much. So if we want to increase in ministry impact, ministry impact, not if I want to increase in fame or whatever. No, if I want to increase in the gospel ministry effectiveness, then the way up is the way down. Be faithful with what God has put on your plate today. Let God turn that into a marvel to say, look where God brought that person from. You know, they, they came from this background or this or that, and look at what they have overcome. That is a marvel. And when we can say, I praise the Lord that he is the only reason why I'm here today. And we thank God for that. And let that speak. Let that be the Holy Spirit's voice to the world of saying, see, I can do this for you too. So imagine what kind of upgrades we'll have when we are faithful here on the earth and then we get heaven. It's going to be amazing and it's going to be amazing forever. Uh, so let's start the party early, if it were, and welcome the Holy Spirit into our life and follow his decrees and follow what he is going to do. His vision for us is to conform us to the likeness of Christ and to help people come to faith. So if that's what the Holy Spirit's job is, we're gonna see and perceive the Holy Spirit's encouragement and power, whether it's mundane or marvelous, uh, in uh, 
in an increasing way the more that we are actually involved in what he is doing. Otherwise, he needs to babysit us and convict us of sin for us to turn, not guilt us of sin, convict us. Like give us this like a conviction like, you know what, I, gotta, I just got to stop doing this. I got to start doing that. That's what he is going to do in our lives. So now on to the miraculous. I don't need to talk too much about the miraculous. Everybody knows, uh, you know, that uh, someone like Samson, absolutely miraculous that he could go out and take on a whole army. You know, for uh, Moses to pray and Joshua out there leading the fighting uh, and then lifting up uh, Moses' hands for a whole day, the sun doesn't go down, clearly absolutely miraculous. Creation, completely a miracle. Virgin birth, miracle. You know, we see the miraculous happening in front of us. We see that, you know, uh, Peter, when he heals the beggar at the gate, when we see the Paul, he heals a gentleman, and uh, the people go nuts in Ephesus. Clearly, those are are very showy and very miraculous, uh, supernatural. There's no way that that had anything to do with people. And so with that, um, I, 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 it's easy to teach on that because that's probably most of the Bible stories that you know are of the miraculous things that God has done. And those are important because all of those testify to our faith. And the Holy Spirit may lead you into that. We do pray for healing. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. You know, and in fact, I would say of all the people I've prayed for for healing, about 99% of the time, it doesn't happen the way we expect it or the way we prayed it. And uh, sometimes it's maybe our faith isn't enough because we can, hey, well, I don't really need to pray for a miracle if I can go to the doctor to get that lump removed. You know, that's kind of the, like, what are we relying on more than God? And, uh, but I tell you this, I have seen healing, things that, and I have talked to doctors, and they're like, yeah, there's stuff that there's no way we can explain it, and it has to be supernatural. And I say this to encourage you to keep praying and to never give up, because that's what we're taught to do, is to pray and never give up. It's easy to get discouraged when you're praying for something that doesn't happen. You know, uh, it says like in Proverbs, like our bones basically groan when we have a hope that is deferred. And so this is why we want to pray the Holy Spirit be involved in our life. Now, sometimes the Lord will leave you hanging to test your faith. Not to test you to try to get you out of the faith, but to test you to know where your limits are. So I say this, what could happen in your life that would make you turn from the Lord? And if that's that, the Holy Spirit then needs to guard you and teach you to protect against that. So if you're in it, um, for just the, the, you know, the benefits of it, and you can't do some long suffering for God, then he needs to teach you how to long suffer because he has long suffered with not just us, but all of humanity for a very long time. And so he needs to teach us these things. Next on the miraculous side of things is that we do need to keep praying for miracles. Um, why? You know what? I, my, my, I'll give an example with my children and it reminded me of my childhood. I never once, my kids never once doubted my ability to give them ice cream. Every Dairy Queen you drive by, can we have some ice cream? Every uh, night before supper, it's usually before supper, they get the craving, they start to get hungry, can I have ice cream? I can say no a thousand times, but they never give up. I can say no a thousand times, but they know one day I'm gonna give in because they've experienced it in the past and they know that I have the ability to and they know that I'm close enough to ask. Can we have the faith of a child and pray and not give up? Even if a child asks a thousand times, they'll ask 1,000 more if they can get that ice cream just once. We need to be persistent in our prayer. And then we'll see that, yes, God, we are patient. This is how much we want this. This is how much we want to see your glory. Now, we do always pray with an open hand saying, God, if you got a better plan, we're open to it. But we just need this relief. And, uh, you know, we often say that we, you know, we respect the doctors. Luke uh, was a doctor. And we thank God for that. So it doesn't mean we need to discount doctors. It means we need to make sure that we don't shut God out of the miracle business because miracles still exist. And they've been documented all throughout. Uh, the last 2,000 years of the church age. And finally, there's some some invisible ways to which God has worked. And the miraculous is really that where it's pretty much all God. Um, Now, uh, as as we talk about this, I want to get back to you with King Hezekiah. He was being attacked, besieged by Sennacherib, who was an Assyrian ruler. He had already taken out Aram. He had already taken out Moab. He had already taken out the, the north part of Israel. And Judah sitting here going, I've got the biggest army we've ever faced who is encircled around us, and we are hopeless to fight against them. But the prophets from Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the they're saying, no, if you stand firm in the Lord, don't trust in spear, don't trust in military might, and don't look at his military might and quiver, know that you have a God in Israel. 
And so the ultimate thing was to not try to go mano y mano, man against man. But Hezekiah went when he received the letter and he goes up in the house of the Lord and he spreads it out before the Lord and he says, Lord, what shall we do? He's right. He did do this because the letter stated that he said, oh, King Hezekiah, don't let your high walls or even your God uh, lead you to think that you can be, uh, beat us because every other town and city that we took over claimed their God would rescue them. And now I'm their king. So he admitted the valor, he admitted the success, and he admitted the blasphemy that Sennacherib had accomplished and how he muted all the other gods. And Hezekiah is saying, okay, God, are you going to, are you, are you going to come through on this or not? And he humbled himself. And that was the key to going up was he humbled himself. If he just said, God, I need military might, it wouldn't have happened. So God ended up bringing a great victory that day because the man humbled himself. So sometimes in life, so this is really what we're kind of uh, nail some of this down to, is God's going to work very mundane in your life. And sometimes it's going to be a very miraculous where you haven't even touched it one little bit. Sometimes it's going to be a marvel where you're like King David, you're going out against the, the giant and you succeed. And, but in the mundane things, so we, we see that there's going to be times where it's God with us empowering us, and then it's God doing it instead of us. So Sennacherib was too big for Hezekiah to have anything to do with. So God dealt with it personally and fully on his own. So sometimes when we know that there's a diagnosis where man can't do anything anymore and we pray and it happens, we know that God has done that fully and thoroughly. But don't let the fact that miracles can happen, let us be lazy. You know, we do want to pray for the extreme. We do want to pray for that which is beyond our hands. But we don't want to try to get a miracle involved in everything. Why? Because we'll be lazy. You know, we have to have faith too. So faith means walking it out with God. If he is Emmanuel, God with us, then we should expect a lot of the mundane things to be known that God is just with us. That's why in the Bible, the vast majority of them are marvelous cases and mundane cases of the Holy Spirit giving the person, the individual, or the church body just enough encouragement, enough power to accomplish what needed to happen and to glorify God. And the whole point of glorifying God is so that more people can get to heaven. So as we look at what the Holy Spirit can do in our lives, know this, that he quickens the heart. So I encourage you, if you have never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have never trusted him for salvation, I pray that you do so. And I pray that you are aware that the Holy Spirit is nudging your heart to do so. That's why people, when presented with the gospel, have really one or two reactions. And that is one of like a deep conviction, like, you know what, I really do need to get right with the Lord. And the other is kind of like you start to be like, oh, you put up your guard. It's because you're resisting and you don't even really know it. Any other belief system, people are like, huh, I'll ponder that maybe. You know, but why is it that the name of Jesus and the conviction of the Holy Spirit definitely kind of makes us want to uh, you know, <laughs> fight it or, or accept it? And so I want to encourage you that Jesus loves you. He wants to empower you. He died for you according to the scriptures. And on the third day, he rose again, proving he had the power over life and death. And he gave us the Holy Spirit so that we will have times of refreshing and empowerment to accomplish his gospel in this day and age. May we be found faithful in our city and our day uh, in this generation so that a generation that will come after us will say, thank you, God, that that generation was faithful in delivering the gospel message down through the ages. And we will be blessed. And one day we'll all be reunited with all the saints through all time in heaven. And it will be one big party. Well, thank you for coming to church today. We pray that God blesses you mightily and that you are aware of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life. Have a great day. I'm really thankful you've taken the time to watch these broadcasts of ours where we're teaching and putting the good news of Jesus Christ forward. I'd love to get connected with you. I know there are hundreds of people that I don't know yet who watch our material and I'd love to get connected with you to either help you with questions you might have about your faith, to help you get connected to use your gifts in ministry and, uh, and to see what we could possibly do together to see the Lord do great things in our city and beyond. And so it's an easy way for you to get connected to us is by going on our website at regalchurch.com or emailing uh, us at the office at regalchurch.com uh, your information. We have an electronic communication card on our website. You can get connected to us on Facebook via Messenger and other things like that. So we encourage you that uh, you've watched it. Now let's get connected and see what God can do with you and me and the future as we go ahead. Now, for those of us who believe in the mission of Jesus Christ and want to see it go forward, I want to encourage you that we know that the Bible teaches us to use our time, talent, and treasures to make sure that this good news of Jesus Christ and lots of help goes out to the world. 
And so with that, uh, we have an email where you can give an email money transfer or hit the address to the church that you can uh, send a check or drop by on church on Sunday. We don't ask offering from our guests, nor do we ask it from those who don't believe. It is a privilege that we as Christians get to give joyfully and be a part of God's mission. That one day when we go to heaven, God is going to point out people that because of our efforts that we helped to get them to heaven. So I uh, encourage you to do this. Generosity is something that uh, many of us do here at the church in order to make sure that this gospel goes out from us. It came to us at a high price. So let's see it, that we can be faithful stewards of this message of Jesus Christ and the love that comes from helping others along the way to see that this gets done and modeled for many others in the days and years ahead. I want to give a heartfelt thanks for those that do give. Your sacrificial giving has made a difference and has reached thousands.